Philadelphia International Medicine, PIM, provides international patients and physicians with access to an unmatched network of world-renowned doctors, surgeons, and hospitals that deliver personalized medical, surgical, and rehabilitative care ranked among the best in the world. Since 1999, Philadelphia International Medicine has helped patients and physicians from around the globe eliminate the guesswork, planning, and anxiety of finding and connecting with doctors and hospitals ranked among the best in the world. With eight hospitals, two medical schools, two cancer centers, and hundreds of top doctors, only PIM can bring you into its medical family with one easy phone call or email. Thanks for joining our presentation. Philadelphia International Medicine's Global Education Media Program is a monthly digital platform that invites physicians from around the world to exchange knowledge and innovative uses of medical technology, review the latest advancements in research and clinical care, and share best practices in case reviews. To contact our presenter, refer a patient, or more information, email physicians at philadelphiamedicine.com. Follow PIM's YouTube channel for more educational videos. It's a pleasure to be here today uh, to talk to the international community about uh, ischemic stroke in young adults. Um, this is a topic that traditionally has been thought to be quite rare. When we think about stroke, we usually think about it as happening in older people and really only happening in older people. However, there are some alarming trends that show now uh, this is not the case, um, that strokes are happening more and more frequently in younger people. At Thomas Jefferson, we have a 24 bed acute stroke unit and at any given time, about a third of those uh, beds are occupied by younger stroke patients. Uh, in 2012, there was a study published in uh, uh, neurology. Uh, it looked at stroke trends in the Ohio, Kentucky uh, states uh, between the years of 1993 to 2005. And while the overall rate of stroke decreased during this period of time, the rate of stroke in the age range of 20 years to 54 years actually increased from about 13% to almost 20%. Um, reflecting a trend towards increasing stroke incidence at a younger age. Now, before going any further, we really should define who we mean by young. What age group are we talking about? In medicine, when we have uh, an age cutoff, it's always somewhat arbitrary. Um, but in looking at previous studies, uh, that have uh, reviewed stroke in young adults, most of these studies have come to the consensus that we are talking about patients in the 15 to maybe 50 uh, years uh, of age range. Uh, in some of the cardiac literature, this uh, uh, upper limit um, can be uh, increased to about 65, but in general, we're talking about 15 to 50 year olds. Uh, Putala uh, and his colleagues uh, uh, published a Helsinki Young Stroke Registry several years ago in which they looked at almost a over a thousand uh, patients in this age group, about 15 to about 50, with, uh, admitted with their first ever ischemic stroke. And the purpose of this uh, registry was really to try and identify uh, some underlying uh, risk factors for these younger patients who are having strokes. And as you can see here, uh, when they looked at a family history of stroke, uh, dyslipidemia, smoking, hypertension, so on and so forth, atrial fibrillation, they looked at as well. The top three risk factors for having stroke at a young age were dyslipidemia, smoking, and high blood pressure. And this was true of men and women. So these risk factors, these three, we call them the trifecta, um, which applies in our older stroke patients, uh, is really applicable in our younger stroke patients as well. So uh, in this age group, when, when I treat a young stroke patient, I always look for those most common things. Do they have, uh, do they, do they have uh, some uh, undiagnosed or untreated dyslipidemia or uh, high blood pressure? Are they smokers? Um, and so that's the first thing that I think about. Now, after that, um, the uh, cause of stroke in the young is really 
too numerous for us to go through in detail today. Um, as you can see here, this is a very comprehensive list of all of the um, different uh, causes that have been associated with stroke in young patients. And they range from uh, angiopathies, um, which can be atherosclerotic or non-atherosclerotic diseases of the blood vessels, to hematologic conditions, you know, um, hypercoagulable states, sickle cell disease, for example, genetic causes, uh, uh, and to inflammatory and, and infectious causes, for example, uh, temporal arteritis or neurosarcoidosis or HIV. Um, uh, the, the etiologies for stroke in young people are really quite uh, varied. Um, we mustn't also forget that a young person presenting with stroke really deserves a very in-depth cardiac workup. And so, as you can see uh, on the left uh, side here, um, there are quite a few major uh, risk factors uh, for stroke when it comes to underlying cardiac disease and also some other uh, minor risks as well. Again, uh, it would be overly ambitious to try and touch upon each and one, every one of these uh, during today's session. So what I thought I would do uh, would, uh, is to, would be to present a, a few cases um, that uh, we frequently encounter in our stroke unit and are somewhat uh, controversial in terms of their management and to uh, go through them today um, and uh, sort of illustrate some of uh, the different management um, styles um, when it comes to uh, stroke in young people with these conditions. Uh, this uh, slide just goes on to illustrate that um, despite all of the uh, previous etiologies that I mentioned that can be cause of stroke in young adults, quite frequently cryptogenic stroke uh, is uh, the, uh, the end diagnosis. So despite having gone through a quite thorough workup, a lot of times in our young adults, the underlying etiology is, is not determined and uh, these are deemed cryptogenic stroke. So these are uh, quite a few studies that have looked at stroke etiology in young patients. You can see it's an international list of studies here. And um, uh, a lot of these studies have shown that the etiology of stroke in young patients can range from large artery atherosclerosis, cardiac sources, small vessel disease, other uh, etiologies, and then finally undetermined uh, etiologies, which would land a patient with that cryptogenic stroke diagnosis. So let's move on to case one. Um, this is a case of a 46-year-old man with a history of reflux disease and remote prostate uh, cancer, uh, but otherwise is healthy. Uh, he presents with acute blurry vision while watching television at home. He's a non-smoker. Uh, his only outpatient meds are omeprazole for the GERD. His blood pressure was a little bit elevated on presentation, but not, uh, not uh, extremely elevated. And his heart rate was uh, regular, uh, rate and rhythm. On exam, he has a right homonymous hemianopsia, but otherwise his neurologic exam is intact. And we see here from his CAT scan that there is a hypodensity in the left occipital lobe uh, that uh, would be responsible for his right uh, homonymous hemianopsia. So this looks like an ischemic stroke on CT. In terms of his workup, uh, his lab work um, uh, uh, was all uh, pretty rather benign. Hemoglobin A1C was normal, so there's no underlying diabetes. His lipid panel, including his LDL, total cholesterol, triglycerides, all normal. CBC is within normal limits. His vessel imaging, uh, which uh, uh, was MRA of the head and neck, were all uh, normal as well. So there was no indication of major atherosclerotic changes or uh, a large vessel vasculitis. Um, his 2D echocardiogram showed normal systolic ejection fraction and chambers of the heart were of normal size. However, um, during a bubble study in which we uh, injected agitated saline through a peripheral IV, uh, there were some bubbles crossing into the left heart uh, consistent with a PFO. This was then followed up by a transesophageal echocardiogram, which confirmed a very small PFO, but no atrial septal aneurysm. Uh, and as a, uh, as a part of the routine workup, he also got a lower extremity ultrasound. There was no DVT there. Um, 
uh, and he even got an MRV of the pelvis to make sure that there were no hidden clots uh, in um, the, uh, uh, in the uh, abdominal uh, vasculature. So in a case like this, uh, the workup thus far has been quite thorough. Um, really, there's we haven't um, shown any sort of uh, etiology for, for this patient's stroke. Um, we frequently get referrals on patients like this from other hospitals where a thorough workup has been done, nothing much has been shown, and we get um, asked, well, this patient now is a cryptogenic stroke. Uh, there's a small PFO. Should this PFO be closed? Right. So that's a. This is a very hot topic, and has been a hot topic in, uh, in the stroke world for quite some time. Uh, a PFO is a patent foramen ovale. Right. It's uh, a, a persistent defect between the two atrial chambers of the heart, which normally uh, upon a baby's first few breaths should close up nicely and there should not be this defect. This, uh, the prevalence of a PFO in the general population is approximately 25%. So almost one in every four people has a PFO. It's quite common. Um, studies have uh, shown though that the prevalence for PFOs in the cryptogenic uh, stroke population, young stroke population, might be as high as 40%. So there's been a lot of interest in looking at PFOs as a potential cause, perhaps, of a stroke in young adult, of uh, cryptogenic strokes. Um, and, uh, and to date, really, the secondary prevention for patients with cryptogenic stroke and a PFO is really unclear. What should you do in these patients who otherwise do not have a clear underlying cause for their stroke but are found to have a PFO? Should we anticoagulate these people, put them on very strong blood thinner? Should we close these patients with the device so that there's no uh, ongoing defect that might transmit clots? Uh, it really is uh, unclear. Uh, the past, in the past decade, uh, the uh, management of PFOs has really swung like a pendulum from side to side. Um, at one point, uh, uh, studies were showing, uh, in the 1990s, studies were showing some benefit uh, in closure. And subsequently, uh, in uh, 2012, 2013, there were three studies, closure one, the PC trial and RESPECT trials, which all showed negative results when it came to secondary stroke prevention uh, with PFO closure. So these studies were very large studies. Um, the closure one and RESPECT trial enrolled almost 1,000 patients. PC was uh, around 400 patients. These studies all showed that uh, despite closing these PFOs in these uh, stroke patients, they still went on to have, you know, just the same number of recurrent strokes as patients that were being medically managed. So the pendulum swung to the other side for quite a while, saying that for these patients with cryptogenic stroke and PFO, we really probably uh, have, there's no benefit in closing them. Uh, this past year, however, uh, three studies were again published in the New England Journal of Medicine, kind of tipping the, uh, the, the, the scale the other way. So the REDUCE trial, uh, the CLOSE trial, and then the RESPECT trial, which was the same one that had been done previously, but this was just extended follow-up, actually showed somewhat of a benefit in closing these stroke, cryptogenic stroke patients with PFOs. So now, uh, you know, the latest thinking in the stroke world is that uh, if somebody uh, does present with a cryptogenic stroke but has a PFO, maybe we should perhaps think about getting them closed. And you might ask, what has caused this change, right, from three negative trials to three positive trials? Um, we really think that as with a lot of different um, uh, trials, it really is uh, patient selection. Uh, these, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're finally selecting the right patients to close. For example, we should be closing patients with larger PFOs, not small ones. PFOs that are associated with atrial septal aneurysms are considered to be maybe more high risk PFOs when it comes to stroke for whatever reason. So larger PFOs with atrial septal aneurysm. And then 
um, these studies, these latter studies were uh, a bit better at making sure that patients had really did have true strokes to begin with. The previous um, studies on PFOs allowed uh, patients who had just TIAs to get admitted. And sometimes that can become um, very murky in terms of whether a TIA is truly a TIA or perhaps some sort of um, mimic a uh, stroke mimic, perhaps a migraine or something like that. So the thinking is that these latest studies are positive because of better patient selection. And um, uh, this is just a schematic of what um, the, the PFO, the defect looks like. This is one that's associated with an atrial septal aneurysm. You see this outpouching in, of, of tissue here. This is what we would consider perhaps uh, a type of PFO that is more high risk. It's very large um, and you can imagine that clots would get stuck here and be able to go through very easily. So this is the type of PFO. If you found it in a cryptogenic stroke patient, you might then recommend or refer to a cardiology colleague for closure. And the latest device is this Amplatzer device shown in the lower uh, right-hand corner. Um, our uh, Academy of uh, American Academy of Neurology uh, had uh, uh, published a summary of um, uh, guidelines for clinicians prior to those latest uh, 2017 trials um, uh, results being shown. And you know the, they really haven't changed uh, any of their uh, practice advisories as of this point. Um, the, the wording is such that um, uh, the procedure uh, should not be uh, routinely offered um, to patients with cryptogenic stroke. Um, uh, and we really are not quite sure exactly what type of medication to use for stroke prevention in these cases. But uh, it will be interesting to see if our American Academy of Neurology publishes a new set of guidelines uh, based on the, the, the latest uh, trials uh, that I just showed you that were published in 2017. Case two, uh, we'll move on to, uh, involves a 40-year-old woman with no significant past medical history uh, presenting with neck pain. She, had, uh, she did have a cold and had some major coughing and sneezing um, uh, attacks a few weeks prior, but uh, quote unquote, nothing major. Um, she's not on any chronic medications. Her blood pressure and heart rate are all normal. And on exam, she has no focal neurologic deficits. Um, her neck pain, though, was significant enough uh, to warrant some imaging, and uh, this is uh, an example of uh, MRA, uh, which we call with dissection protocol or fat sac protocol. And you can see here, this is her uh, right vertebral artery, which shows a very normal uh, flow void. And then on the left here, this dark area, this flow void is much smaller to indicate a stenosed artery. And you see all around it, this brightness, which we call a crescent sign. That is a, uh, that is pathognomonic for a um, vertebral artery dissection, a tear in the vertebral artery. And then you can see on the 3D reconstructed views that indeed this vertebral artery on the left compared to the right one looks sort of irregular. So cervical artery dissection uh, accounts for 2% uh, of all strokes in the general population, but up to 20% of strokes in young adults. It is uh, oftentimes cited as the most common cause of stroke in young adults. So it's very important to be familiar uh, with, uh, with, this, um, uh, with this disease state. Um, it can happen in any of the cervical arteries, so carotids or vertebral arteries, although it is more common in the carotid artery. A normal artery should have very nice, smooth laminar blood flow going, uh, going uh, up the neck. But you can see in the case of a dissection, there is a tear between the two, uh, between two layers of the walls of the artery. Most frequently, it's between the intima and the media. And then here, when there becomes a tear, you can see the, the, the parent artery can become stenosed, which limits blood flow, blood flow. You can have all kinds of turbulent blood flow along the dissection, which creates clots, which can then propagate upwards. Um, and so this is the mechanism by which um, strokes can develop as a result of a dissection. 
Deceptions can be spontaneous or traumatic. About 50% of the time, we can elicit some sort of trauma prior to um, the tear happening. And it doesn't have to be significant trauma, such as being, uh, you know, in, in some sort of um, getting stabbed in the neck or anything like that. It can be as uh, benign as a violent coughing spell or a violent sneeze. Um, I've had patients who have told me they just started a new Pilates or yoga class with extension of the neck and stretching. These, uh, this, this type of uh, problem used to be called a beauty parlor stroke because older uh, women would go to um, the hairdresser and get their hair done. They would lay their uh, head back into the um, uh, sort of basin to get their hair washed and uh, have hyperextension of the neck that way and then present with a dissection and a stroke. Um, a very important uh, association to be aware of uh, is this association between cervical artery dissections and cervical manipulative therapy. Um, uh, 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 otherwise uh, known as uh, neck manipulation. Um, so oftentimes uh, patients uh, who have chronic neck pain will go uh, and uh, to a chiropractor and get chiropractic neck manipulation. And if you've ever seen that happen or seen videos of it, um, you know how violent, how violently those twists and turns of the neck can be. And so um, uh, there have been so many reported incidences of dissections happening after after these types of neck manipulations that have prompted the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association to release a scientific statement about this, uh, I believe it was two or three years ago. And the take home point of this uh, statement was just that although the overall incidence is quite low, practitioners should be uh, aware of this possibility and inform patients of this association. And a lot of what I do is stroke prevention, right? So in talking to patients about controlling blood pressure, controlling diabetes, things like that to prevent stroke, I also do tell them uh, I would not recommend that you ever go see a chiropractor for, for neck manipulation. Um, the good news about cervical artery dissections is that there is good functional recovery in the majority of patients after six months. The mortality rate is very low, only about 5%, and the risk of recurrent dissections is quite low as well. Um, Recanalization of the dissected artery um, occurs in the vast majority of cases, up to 85% of cases, and it happens on its own. Uh, the vessel just needs time, and usually that ranges from about three months to a year. Uh, during this time, we do get what we call surveillance scans. So you do need to uh, get imaging of the, of the vessel that's involved, whether it be an MRA of the neck um, or a CTA of the neck to make sure that it is healing up properly. Uh, there's only been one uh, randomized controlled trial uh, performed looking at uh, the type of uh, medication these patients uh, with dissection should be on. While we are waiting for the uh, dissected artery to heal, we need to make sure we prevent strokes, prevent clots, right? And so what do we use? Should we use aspirin? Should we use anticoagulation like Coumadin? Um, this CADIS trial was uh, really uh, had had the stroke has had the stroke world really um, excited because we thought that finally we would get some answers. Um, this uh, addressed this question of uh, whether uh, to use antiplatelet treatment or anticoagulation for cervical artery dissections. And again, it's the only uh, randomized uh, controlled study out there. Uh, unfortunately, though, they had a very difficult time enrolling patients. They only enrolled 250 patients over a 10-year period. And the statistical analysis done prior to, the, to, to all of this showed that really to detect a difference in the treatment efficacy, they, they really needed to enroll almost 10,000 patients. So this was grossly underpowered. Um, as you can see here, uh, they only had four events, recurrent strokes, um, to, and so there is really no significant data uh, information uh, to be uh, taken from this from this study. Uh, there's been a lot of um, 
uh, criticism about it. Um, one of the criticisms being that only two thirds of the patients actually even had confirmed dissections. Um, so unfortunately, the CADIS trial, um, while uh, seemed very promising, has not given us much information about what to use uh, for stroke prevention while we're waiting for these uh, dissection patients uh, to heal. Um, uh, the latest guidelines from our American Heart Association and American Stroke Association are not of much help either. Uh, they basically say that for patients with an ischemic stroke and a dissection, you can use an antiplatelet or anticoagulation. And really the relative efficacy of each one is, is really unknown. So how do, how do I choose what to use? Uh, the management considerations that I, that I consider are antiplatelet agents are often better suited for the active lifestyle of our younger patients. So, um, so when, uh, when I'm able to, I, I tend to lean towards an agent like aspirin or Plavix. Um, and also most of these dissections are in the neck. However, if they do extend intracranially, like a vertebral, like a distal vertebral dissection, um, uh, then I tend to be a little bit less aggressive with my blood thinner as well and, and use an antiplatelet agent. That's because if they do have a bleed um, and bleed intracranially, that could potentially make a bad situation worse. I uh, consider anticoagulation, for example, with Coumadin uh, in cases where the dissection results in a severe stenosis, and I really am concerned um, that there's going to be a lot of uh, 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 turbulent flow and clots and um, uh, warranting a stronger blood thinner. If there is a pseudo aneurysm that results um, from the dissection, again, very turbulent flow, lots of clots. If there's a free floating thrombus associated with the dissection, I will certainly uh, consider anticoagulation. And if the patient has recurrent symptoms or recurrent stroke while already on uh, an antiplatelet agent, then it would be time, I think, to consider anticoagulation. Our third case uh, involves a 30-year-old um, healthy woman uh, with acute onset of double vision. Um, she takes uh, oral contraceptives, but no other medications. She uh, states that she's a weekend smoker. There's no history of DVT, pulmonary embolism, or miscarriages, and there's no significant family history of early stroke either. Um, her blood pressure and heart rate and rhythm are relatively normal, uh, but on exam, she does have a left uh, third nerve palsy. And we can see um, on this uh, diffusion weighted MRI here, there is in the uh, midbrain here, a tiny little area of restricted diffusion, most likely responsible for her, uh, for her stroke. This is by no means a large vessel occlusion. This is probably a small vessel disease stroke, right? From some of the perforators coming off of her basilar artery. And what, what would be the cause of stroke in, in, in this young woman uh, whose workup wound up being completely uh, unremarkable? Well, um, we uh, uh, thought that perhaps it was related to uh, her, her hormonal contraception. Um, there are uh, 11 million women uh, in the US ages 15 to 44 on oral contraceptives. Um, and we know that there is an increase in stroke risk um, with increasing age uh, um, of use on OCPs. So for the uh, people, uh, for the women on OCPs uh, in the age group of you know, 15 to 19, the stroke risk is quite low. But as you get up higher to 45 to 49 years of age in OCP use, the stroke risk does increase. Um, uh, overall, there's an increased risk of perhaps twofold uh, compared to those who do not use hormonal contraception. So they're, they're at double the risk uh, for stroke. Um, we know that higher dose estrogen formulations uh, confer a higher risk than lower dose estrogen formulations. Um, most uh, oral contraceptives are uh, more higher dose progesterone. Uh, and to date, progesterone has not been linked uh, to contribute to much risk. So that's good news. 
um, having a prothrombotic uh, mutation can increase the risk uh, more than tenfold in women using hormonal contraception. So that is uh, certainly uh, an important uh, thing to consider. Uh, if you have a patient who is on OCPs and also is known to have some sort of, some sort of prothrombotic mutation, then their stroke risk really is elevated. The latest guidelines um, that are published from the American Stroke Association uh, for the prevention of stroke in young women um, uh, states that oral contraceptives might be harmful in women with additional risk factors such as smoking, high blood pressure, migraine headaches, um, and this should be assessed and needs to be addressed. Um, uh, and we said that, again, that prothrombotic mutations can also put these patients at high risk for stroke. But at this point, the routine screening for these mutations before initiation of OCPs is not recommended, only because these prothrombotic mutations are, are still considered uh, quite uh, rare. On the flip side of things, um, I often get asked about uh, pregnancy and stroke risk. So I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about this uh, as well. Um, thankfully, the incidence of uh, stroke uh, and pregnancy is, is quite low, um, but when it does come up, it presents a significant mor morbidity and mortality risk for both mother and baby. So it's a quite serious uh, uh, topic. Um, there are about uh, 30, in a registry, uh, we found that uh, there are about 34 strokes in uh, about 100,000 deliveries. Uh, this was a registry done in, uh, at a, a tertiary center um, hospital on the, on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, and the recent study by uh, the Center for Disease Control indicates that pregnancy-related strokes may slightly be on the rise. Um, what are the causes of uh, stroke during pregnancy? There are a few. We know that during pregnancy, there is venous stasis. Um, there is edema and a hypercoagulable state is imparted. Um, and then also pregnancy-induced hypertension. So all of these things uh, can, uh, can, can uh, increase the risk of stroke uh, in a pregnant uh, patient. Um, and this was a study uh, published uh, quite some time ago, but uh, it really helped us to define uh, the uh, time period during which uh, a pregnant uh, woman is at highest risk for stroke. And uh, in looking at all of these uh, different complications, uh, cerebrovascular complications uh, during uh, pregnancy, like a vasculopathy, dissection, uh, TTP, cortical vein thrombosis, so on and so forth, they all seem to be uh, at uh, most prevalent uh, in the postpartum uh, uh, time period, um, which is surprising to some that uh, after delivery is when a lot of these patients present with cerebrovascular issues. Um, a more recent article actually showed um, that the risk of a thrombotic event um, persisted even after the six-week postpartum period. Maybe there's an elevated risk of thrombotic events um, that remains high up to 12 weeks postpartum. Um, <clears throat> so these patients really uh, deserve quite a bit of medical attention. Uh, Low-dose aspirin is now considered safe to use throughout pregnancy. There used to be some hesitation um, due to uh, the thought that it might lead to some congenital defects. Um, but we now know that um, low-dose aspirin is safe to use throughout pregnancy. Um, and that can be very helpful uh, for a patient <clears throat> in which you're trying to prevent um, an ischemic uh, event uh, or who has had one and you need to put them um, <clears throat> on some sort of blood thinner. So in a patient with new onset headache, in a pregnant patient <clears throat> or peripartum woman with a new onset headache, blurred vision, seizures, you definitely would want to consider peripartum stroke. And that can be arterial or it can be venous uh, 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 infarcts. Um, and also think about vasculopathies um, as the cause as well. Um, posterior uh, reversible encephalopathy syndrome, or PRESS, reversible cerebrovasoconstriction uh, syndrome, or RCVS, are things to consider particularly in uh, a, a peripartum woman. 
Um, we also now know that pregnancy uh, complications um, uh, can also increase the risk, um, the, the, the long-term stroke risk, not just the immediate stroke risk. Um, Preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, they're all associated with an increased risk of future cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. Um, and so it's very important to ask about these risk factors when taking an initial history and physical or when a patient first comes into your clinic um, and you're trying to sort of gather their, their stroke risk. Um, women who've had with a history of preeclampsia have uh, perhaps a 10 time uh, increased risk of chronic hypertension, which we know increases the stroke risk. And about half of women with gestational diabetes will go on to develop diabetes type 2 in the next 5 to 10 years, which again is another stroke risk factor. Um, I'm going to end with just a, a few slides um, uh, highlighting um, uh, how devastating uh, stroke in young adults can be. Um, you know, there was a study um, looking at post-stroke fatigue and its association with poor functional outcome after stroke in young adults. And um, you can see here that the prevalence of fatigue in pa young uh, stroke patients who not just had ischemic stroke, but even TIA is quite high, up to 40%. And there are complaints of cognitive, residual cognitive uh, problems in a, a large uh, majority of these patients going from ranging from speed of processing to working memory, attention, executive functioning. And this is really um, uh, uh, impactful on their ability to return to work as uh, productive citizens, right? So this is really, uh, can be quite devastating. Um, this was a study published out of Norway, uh, which uh, showed that ischemic stroke at a young age is a serious event. Um, and despite perhaps good physical uh, 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 improvements and outcomes after a stroke, uh, a lot of uh, patients, a high percentage of patients uh, will report ongoing memory problems, um, sleeping problems, um, and difficulty going back to full-time work. Um, there, I thought this, uh, this study was quite interesting, looking at social dysfunction after a mild uh, first ever stroke at a young age. So these are patients who really did not have any uh, uh, major physical or language impairment after their stroke. Their, their stroke was quite mild, yet when they were asked questions about their uh, perceived impairments, about ability to work, uh, manage their home, enjoy uh, social aspects of their lives, maintain close relationships, they really reported uh, significant um, problems um, with, with, with those domains. Um, Long-term consequences of stroke in young adults, again, like I said, up to 80% majority of patients achieve a Rankin score. This is a functional outcome of zero to two, which is very good. That means that they can um, still maintain their independence and they can walk on their own, dress themselves, that sort of thing. However, uh, maybe up to half of these patients suffer from ongoing depression and fatigue, and about a third of these patients develop chronic headache or pain, which can be very, very uh, difficult uh, to treat. So in conclusion, um, ischemic stroke uh, in young adults does occur and is becoming a more prevalent problem. We definitely have to consider both traditional risk factors as well as less commonly encountered in etiologies, such as uh, 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 hematologic um, uh, abnormalities, um, genetic risk factors, so on and so forth, um, when trying to identify the cause of stroke in this subgroup. And uh, there are still a lot of controversial management um, styles when it comes to stroke in young adults. For PFOs, should they be closed? PFO in a young cryptogenic stroke patient, should that be closed? A uh, young patient presenting with a dissection, what type of medication do you use? A young woman who has been on OCPs, should you take her off of it? Um, should you keep her on it? Um, and in the pregnant woman, uh, how do you manage uh, her to get her uh, through uh, her stroke risk or if she's already had a stroke, 
how to get her through that. So lots of questions still regarding the optimal, optimal management of these uh, younger stroke patients. And this uh, cartoon says, good news, your cholesterol has stayed the same, but the research findings have changed. I think this is what makes this topic so interesting to me is that we still have so much more uh, to find out uh, about the proper way to, uh, to manage these patients. Thank you for your time and attention.